Pastor John here. I want to thank you for joining us today. Our sermon this morning is going to be from Luke chapter 21, verses 25 through 38. It's called Stop, Look, Listen. And we're going to ask this question to you today. How do you see the world around you? Did you know that you can see it through eternal eyes? Jesus is going to give us a lesson on how to do this. I'd like you to turn to Luke chapter 21. We're going to be in verses 25 through 38 this morning. While you're turning there, let me, let me just share some of the things that we've done together this week uh, that you might not be aware of, but this is something we've all done together. We were able to financially support the relief efforts in Afghanistan and in Haiti this week. Now, I know, I know that th this might not feel like it has a, an impact on you as you sit here this morning, but let me tell you something. We can't do this unless we're all working together. We, we can't do this sort of thing. We can't reach down into Haiti. We can't reach over to Afghanistan unless we're all doing our part. And that means all those who are praying, all those who are uh, supporting us financially, all those who are helping to come and wipe the, the pews down in the morning to sanitize them, uh, everything that goes into us being a body manifests itself halfway across the world. And so maybe you're not able to, to support us financially right now, but by participating in the body, you're part of our ministry, and right now there are people in Afghanistan and Haiti that are very thankful for your presence here in this body and more to Bible Fellowship. So when we begin looking at these things, it would behoove us to look at them through eternal eyes. This is kingdom work. This is the advancement of the kingdom of God that we are all participating. We're not the only church that's doing this. There are hundreds, thousands of other churches that are doing it, and we're all working together for the sake of the gospel. And so what I want you to remember this morning is that we can see through eternal eyes. Right now, we have to turn our gaze towards New Orleans, Louisiana, Hurricane Ida is coming to shore right now. And there are people that are hurting down there. They keep on getting, it's, those, it's like every time they turn around, they get hit with another natural disaster. So I'd like to take just a moment, and John has covered all this really well in prayer, but I'd like to stop and ju just for a moment and pray for Louisiana and that whole Gulf Coast region. Father, we know you're sovereign. We know that you know all things. And Lord, we also know that there are people that are suffering and about to suffer. We pray now, Father, your protection upon them. We pray your deliverance upon them. We pray most of all, Lord, that you would reveal yourself to them in their time of trouble. We lift up the leadership of this country, Father. We pray you'd bless them with discernment and wisdom in navigating these waters, Afghanistan, Haiti, New Orleans. Lord, there's just so much going on, but we know that you have it all in your hands. So we pray that you would have your way with them and have your way with us even now. And we look forward to seeing your hand moving in all these areas and in our hearts as well. And we pray this in Jesus' name. So let us begin looking at our situations from an eternal perspective. Now, last week we talked about what are you proud of? And we, we, the caution was not to mistake the trappings of our faith for the, the substance of our faith. Uh, our faith and our trust is in Christ alone. And we saw this in, in the story about the old widow. We saw it in the story about the temple. And the fact that, you know, there's a lot of pride taken in the temple. And the temple was going to go away very soon after Jesus spoke about those. So this week we're going to step back and see what can happen when we take our eyes off worldly things and put them on eternal things. Things that have to do with the end of all time. I want you to think about that phrase for a second. The end of all time. This is all going to end. Time will end. What happens at that moment? And we need to not only be looking through the filter of that moment, but we need to be looking forward to it. So our sermon title today is Stop, Look, Listen. This is part 54 of our ongoing series in Luke, God's Love for Everyone. 54. 
We started this in 2019. I think we'll be done in 2025. Our passage today gives us four directives, divided up into four directives for a believer to adhere to if we're going to be prepared for the end. And we need to prepare for that right now. We need to understand that we don't wait until the end is upon us to prepare. You know, the people down in the Gulf region didn't wait for the hurricane to show up. They've been boarding up things and securing things. And so we need to prepare for the end. So we have four directives on things that we can do. We're going to see in verses 25 through 28 of Luke 21. We're going to look in 29 through 33. We will watch in 34 through 36, and then, and then we will learn in verses 37 and 38. So let's take a look at what we're supposed to see. Now, Jesus has taken the time to warn the disciples where to put their trust, not in worldly things. It's not in the prideful and arrogant celebrities of their day, but in the humble, godly servants of the Father in heaven. And uh, and he told them to be cautious where they place the foundations of their faith. It's not in the temple. Again, it's not in earthly things, but it's in the Messiah, the Son of God, in eternal things. So here's a, that's the context of our passage here. Now, he's going to tell them why all this is important. It's not just a, enough to know that we shouldn't put our faith and trust in worldly things. We need to know why. The temple's going to be removed by the time the people standing in front of him die. They're going to see the temple removed. And that's only a harbinger of what is supposed to come. And Jesus is now going to go from the temple's going away to look what's going to happen at the end of all history. Verse 25. And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars and on the earth distresses of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the seas and the waves. Wow. Wow. This is incredible. And, and there's a, this total shift in perspective. Jesus said, I'm not talking about the temple. Let me tell you about the end of all things. I talked to you about the end of the temple. Let's talk about the end of all things. And, and, and notice the people being spoken to are, are no longer his followers, but now he's talking to the nations. He's saying, Pay attention. Everybody pay attention. The whole of creation begins to groan in reaction to the end of all time. You can almost feel the warpage there. The image Jesus wants to paint here is of all mankind being terrorized by the forces of nature, by the roaring of the sea and the waves. Speaks of winds, tremors, floods. Now, That may not mean a lot to us sitting right here this morning, but let me tell you something. I grew up in northeast Ohio. Have you ever been in a tornado? I've been in several of them. And let me tell you something. When, when When you're looking at a tornado, it's kind of fascinating. You see these things coming towards you, the great big funnel cloud, you go, wow, that's really something. And then it dawns on you, it's coming for me. (laughs) And when you're in the middle of it, it's like the world is over. All you, can, all you can experience is wind and shaking, and you feel so small and helpless. And you realize that if the wind gets to you enough, it's just going to blow you away. And if it doesn't blow you away, it might blow something into you, and you can't stop it. That's what Jesus wants them to see here, is how helpless men and women are before the forces of nature. He says, everybody is going to experience this as the end of all time begins to descend upon the world. Verse 26, people feigning with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world for the powers of the heavens will be shaken and fear overtakes the entire population of the earth. It's not just a localized thing. It's not just an earthquake somewhere in some country. We don't know where it is. This is happening everywhere as earth and heaven tremble over what is coming to them. And it leads to the climax of all history. Now, we have a pivotal moment in the history of mankind when Jesus goes to the cross and is resurrected. Our faith is based on the resurrection. But there comes another pivotal moment. There comes a moment when all of history comes to the the crescendo of what God wants to show us. 
Verse 27, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. I used to try to reason through this. I used to say, now we live on a globe. (laughs) And what I see in the clouds is not what somebody in Japan sees in the clouds. Do we not have the technology now? (laughs) For the entire world to see an event as it happens? Is this not a gift from God? You know, it, I, I mean, we keep on hearing this over and over again. We look, see, watch, 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 watch. Well, we can watch this happen now. We, there, doesn't have to be, there doesn't have to be something mystical about it. Jesus is going to come back. Creation is going to tremble. And everybody's going to see him. And the source of all the tumult we find out, all of this shaking and all these natural occurrences that are going on, is Jesus Christ himself, the Messiah, who rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and came in peace, the Savior who allowed himself to be nailed to a cross, the Son of God who was laid in a tomb and rose again and ascended into the presence of the Father in heaven, comes roaring back. And this time, he's riding on a white horse. And his robes are dipped in blood. There's fire coming out of his mouth and his eyes are lightening up like lightning. It's an incredible moment. Comes in incredible power. And that power is energized by the glory of God. We've never seen anything like it. And never will see anything like it again. So in verse 28, now when these things begin to take place, Straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. That doesn't sound like redemption, does it? It doesn't to the people that aren't redeemed. For us, it's our hope. For us, it's our deliverance. For us, it's time to go home to our true home. Redemption is near. We see the glory of God, the return of the risen Savior, the power of the resurrection. We see all that, and we see redemption. Redemption for those who believe in Him. i got to tell you something. If you don't believe Him in that moment, it's too late. It's too late. Now, this is a once in all of eternity event. And Jesus doesn't want us to miss it. And the only way to view that moment without fear and trembling, I mean, literally, the world is falling down around everybody. Creation has risen up and trying to destroy everybody. And the only deliverance, the only way to avoid that moment in fear is to be with and in Christ, even as he's in us. So Jesus wants us to see that. He wants us to see the power and the glory of the resurrection and the ultimate outcome of the resurrection. Let's look at our second directive, which is look, starting in verse 29. And he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they come out in leaves, you see for yourselves and know that the summer is already near. Now, this common sight in Palestine is a, 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 a fig tree. In the wintertime, they're barren. They look dead. And, you know, when the sprouts and the leaves begin to come out, well, we know that summer's coming. It's a dramatic change. Jesus is saying, look around you. Watch out for these changes. See that things are changing around you because it means that this season is changing. Verse 31, he says, So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. In other words, when you see all the events that he's described in the last six verses, when all this begins to unfold, when you watch it happening around you, the fullness of the kingdom is near. The perfection of the kingdom is about to manifest itself. The ultimate redemption of all believers is is at hand. And that's when Jesus will return in glory. You're about to get a glimpse of the glory of God. Verse 32, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all this has taken place. What does that mean? There's a huge debate amongst biblical scholars about who this generation is. And it's a worthy debate. It's kind of interesting to follow. 
Are you talking to the people that are standing there in front of him? Are you talking about the last generation that, that are going to see him return? And it's, there's no easy answer to this. There's no pat, pat response to it. And surely enough, the disciples who are hearing about these signs, we're going to see a lot of them happen by 70 AD, the ones that survive until then. They're going to see the destruction of Jerusalem, and in that respect, the words of Christ apply to those folks in the first century. But there's an eschatological, that's a theological word for end times, eschatological. There's an eschatological application here too. Jesus is saying that once the events are set in motion, the end is inevitable. This is the word of God saying these things are going to happen and here's how it's going to end. So that leads us to a question, well, how near is near? I mean, it's been 2,000 years. What's God waiting for? This is a long time. And i got to tell you something, every generation that has ever existed is absolutely convinced that they're the last generation. I mean, all the way back to the disciples, they thought the kingdom was coming right away. So did Paul. So every generation thinks they're left. When is this going to happen? 2,000 years doesn't sound like very near to us. What does two millennia look like to God? Well, to find out, we can go back to a familiar verse. 1 Peter 3, verse 8 and 9. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises as some count slowness. Now, that in itself is Peter quoting Psalm 90, which says, For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it's past, or as a watch in the night. So, now those verses are used to, to fuel the argument about creation. Oh, that thousand years is a day, and so on. And so on. That's not what the verses are about at all. What they're trying to describe is a God who has no respect for time. God is apart from time. It doesn't matter what it looks like to you. What really matters is what it looks like to God. And God doesn't, doesn't engage in time. He's given us time so that we can gauge our sanctification, so that we can gauge the turning of the seasons. But God is not a respecter of time. So while we may get impatient waiting for the end, we should try to remember that when, once the end comes, we'll be with the Lord. And time to us will become Meaningless. Can you imagine a time, pardon me, <laughs> when time is meaningless? This is a promise from God. He tells us this is going to happen. One day we'll understand how meaningless time is. And Jesus puts a cap on all this with verse 33, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Now, we can try to put a depth of meaning to this, but we have to take it for what it says literally. And everything we know, the heavens and the earth, we're not talking about the conceptual heaven that we, we pray about. We're talking about above, what's above and what's below. Everything, all creation is going to change. It's going to be transformed into something entirely new. Now that, that should have an eternal impact on us. We should pause and think about that for a second. We would do very well to remember that a lot of what we see is not going to survive this final moment. Ideologies, the issues of our day, the things that we place so much importance to, just like the Jews placed importance in that temple, are going to be gone. And we emerge into a new creation. And that new creation is dominated by one thing, brothers and sisters, the glory of God, characterized by His holiness. That's what the new creation is going to be. Now, this should create in us an eternal perspective. These are the eternal eyes we're talking about. And it should help us to evaluate what's important and what's not important, what is temporary and what is eternal. 
at some moment in eternity, we're going to look back, maybe. <laughs> I, I personally believe we'll be so consumed with being in the presence of God and His glory that we're not going to look back on anything. But if we can look back, we're going to look back on the time we're in right now and wonder what all the fuss was about. We thought that was so huge. And the person we're talking to goes, what are you talking about? Ah, let me think if I can remember the details. Because <laughs> it's all going to be gone. And we're going to find out that the only really important thing in anything that we do are the souls of people. The souls of people. Everything else is gone. When Jesus says heaven and earth will pass away, he's talking about creation the way we know it and perceive it. It'll be gone along with all of our concerns, all of our worries, all of those things that we made such big issues out of. All of our worries and all of our fears are gone. Look around you right now. Determine what's important eternally. And if we do that, then we should heed our third directive. Watch. Verse 34. But watch. Watch the people in the other political party. That's what God wants us to do. Watch the people that don't think the way you do. That's what God wants us to do. Watch, watch your neighbor. Watch your boss. Watch your teacher. Watch your people standing next to you. Watch out for all this. And what does the scripture say? It says, watch yourselves. Oh, wait a minute. Now, now we've got to be really careful with this. Because the Pharisees fell into this trap. They're watching everybody but themselves. And Jesus shows up and says, well, really, you're the problem. You know, you're so worried about everybody else and you're so elevated above everybody else judging all this stuff. And you need to look at yourself. He's saying the same thing to us. Watch yourselves. It's easy to get distracted by our own self-interest, by our own self preservation. We have to be vigilant lest your hearts be weighed down, the rest of verse 34 says. With what? Dissipation and drunkenness. Now, I don't know many of you that are, are weighed down with drunkenness. If you are, come and talk to me. But watch this. Dissipation and drunkenness and the cares of this life. And that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come, verse 35, upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Nobody gets away from this. This is a caution not to be consumed with self-gratification, not to be consumed with worry or fear or anger or distrust, but to keep level heads and remain sober. That is to be aware at all times that there's a much bigger story than what's going on in front of us. There's something eternal happening. And brothers and sisters, as believers in Christ, with the, the bigger story, the eternal consequences, we are key players in that. We're God's agents here on this earth. Messengers of the gospel, bearers of His image. We're assigned to be His representatives here. And Scripture warns us not to forget this, to keep our eyes on that. Romans 13, Paul says this in Romans 13, 13. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desire. Paul brings it up again in 1 Thessalonians 5, 6. So let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. And Peter jumps in here too. 1 Peter 4, 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. 
And back in our passage in Luke, verse 36, it said, but stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place. Judgment is coming. And understand that it's coming. And when it's coming, stand before the Son of Man. And what he's really saying is stand before the Son of Man blameless in Christ. Now listen to me carefully here. Jesus is not telling us not to enjoy ourselves. Scripture is filled with encouragement to celebrate uh, when it's appropriate, uh, to experience the joy of being a child of God, to experience the peace of being one with Christ. We have a peace that goes beyond understanding. We're supposed to enjoy that. We are salt and light to the world. We're not a damper to the world, pointing the finger and telling everybody what they're doing wrong. We're supposed to be a nourishment to the world. But Jesus is warning us not to get so caught up in the affairs of the world or its troubles that we forget what we're called to do. We forget what we've been saved to do. Now, this takes constant vigilance. We have to watch ourselves. And if we can manage that, maybe then we can move to our fourth directive, which is to learn. Verse 37. And every day he was teaching in the temple, but at night he went out and lodged in the mount called Olivet. I mean, somebody who doesn't go to church here has been listening to us. And he said, John, you know, I've been listening to you for the last three or four months. It's gospel, 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 gospel. I get it. When are you ready to move on? I said, I, when Jesus is ready to move on. We're telling his story. <laughs> okay? We're coming up to the culmination of Jesus' ministry. And the closer he gets to the cross, the more we hear and see the manifestation of the gospel. Okay, so our fourth directive is to learn. What are we learning here? That every day he was teaching in the temple. These are the last few days before the cross. I want you to think about that for a second. Jesus has come to Jerusalem to die. He knows that he is going to suffer immeasurably at the hands of the scribes and the Pharisees and the Romans. He knows it. He knows it's going to be a dark hour. And what is he doing? Is he concerned with his circumstances? Is he trying to rally support? Is he trying to address the issues of the day? Was he preoccupied with whether or not Nero was being a good emperor or Herod was being a decent king? Was he consumed with the economic practices of the Roman Empire? No, he just flipped a coin to the Pharisees and said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Was he consumed with, with their diplomatic presence in the world? We already know what he was teaching. We saw it back in verse 1 of chapter 20. One day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel. He was teaching and preaching the gospel. He was saving and feeding the souls of the people that were listening to him. In verse 38 in Luke 21, and early in the morning all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. This is far more significant than it looks. The crowds are coming to him. Why are they coming to him? You know why they were coming to him? He wasn't judging them. He wasn't pointing his finger at them. He's pointing his finger at the religious leaders, but not the people that needed him. He actually, he actually made room for them. Think about this. You know, we saw when he cleansed the temple. Money changers are occupying the court of the Gentiles. He chases them out so that there would be room for people who needed to hear the word of God. And people are flocking to them because he ate dinner with them. He reached out to them. He touched their hearts. And in touching their hearts, he saved their souls. He didn't care about their politics. 
Hear me. He didn't care about their ethnicity. He didn't care what gender they were or even what gender they thought they might be. He didn't care about that. He didn't care about their past. Jesus wanted to zero in on their future. He wanted to zero in on eternity. And our fourth directive is in being prepared for eternity is to learn from Jesus what is important. And to follow him as he moves in that direction. He was looking through eternal eyes. And we can do the same thing. So there's our, our four directives. The first one was to see. See the power of the resurrection and the glory of God. And, and we should lay hold of that truth and let it permeate everything that we do and we say. And we, as we look at our current circumstances through eyes that are set on eternity. Not on what's happening around us, but on where everybody's headed. Our second directive was to look. Look around you. Nearly everything you see is temporary. It's all going to go away. It's not going to last into eternity. It's up to us to determine what is important and what is not. And as we do that, we watch, we watch ourselves. And we're cautious not to get caught up in worldly affairs so much that we neglect our eternal calling. You know, we have a saying that we are of the world... We are in the world, but not of it. You know where that comes from? John 17, starting with verse 14. Jesus in his high priestly prayer, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. He's talking about us. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So we function... I mean, if we're going to carry this out, we function as people who live in a material world. So we work, we vote, we have families, we have jobs, we buy and we sell, we make friends, sometimes, sometimes we make enemies, right? We function as living, breathing human beings, but we keep our focus on eternity, we keep our focus on that moment when Jesus comes back in glory. He's our real hope, and he's going to take us to our real home. Our fourth directive is to learn. And we learn how to do all this stuff by emulating Jesus Christ, who while he was facing the cross, while he knew what was coming, knew it was going to be an incredibly painful death, while he was doing all that, he was more concerned about the souls of those he came into contact with than he was anything else. He suffered that death to empower us to carry on his message, be his ambassadors, ambassadors of an eternal kingdom. It's who we are. Our contribution to Haiti, to Afghanistan, and to those people that need help down in the Gulf. It's just the tip of the iceberg, brothers and sisters. That's just the head of the spear. It's just the beginnings of what we can do when we unite with each other and understand that we can see the people around us through eternal eyes. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks that you've given us the capability to understand this, but Lord, we confess that sometimes it's hard to walk out. But Lord, you've given us the Holy Spirit to encourage us, to enable us, to, to motivate us, to move in the directions that you set for us. We pray, Father, we would be diligent to follow that leading and to do it faithfully, Lord, that we might stand before you unaccused on that day that you return that we've done everything we can to explain to people the importance of eternity. We lift these things up to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Pray for the people in the Gulf. Pastor John here again. I want to thank you for spending some time with us. If you're interested in supporting our ministry financially, you can give online at 
wbfva.org, clicking on the giving section. Or you can send us a check to Warrington Bible Fellowship, 46 Winchester Street, Warrington, Virginia, 20186. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear your prayer requests. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back again next week.